We now move on to our third session. Digitalization can provide better access to information and services, as well as new channels for exercising basic human rights. But it can also be used to nurture the opposite. Controlling internet activity, spreading fake news, and impede the freedom of speech, often without the awareness of the citizens. Douglas Rutson is president and CEO of the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, which works in 100 countries on the policy framework for civil society, public participation, and digitalization. Alp Toker is executive director of Global Internet Observatory and Cyber Security Watchdog, NetBlocks. His work has helped communities stay connected around the world in times of emergencies, increasing transparency, supporting development, and opening up a new front in the fight for a reliable, secure, and open internet. To moderate this session, we have Nanjira Sambuli returning. Please welcome them all on stage. Right, mood check. Who has gone through an internet shutdown? Who has experienced one? Okay, okay, good. And some of the apps we heard about, how many of you have used them? Who, who here would be comfortable having to apply for a certificate to use, I don't know, your ID, your birth certificate to use the internet? No. Oh, somebody's okay. We were we, I'd love to find out why that's okay. <laughs> but let's talk about that. And Alp, I want to start with you. You, you monitor, you, you try to give us data-driven evidence on what internet shutdowns look like. Give us a test for some of the insights we've seen based on that quiz right there. What, are we, what, what does that look like out there in the wild world? Right, <laughs> so it turns out uh, the internet is full of surprises. It's never as you expect it. And more often than not, it's not monitored, it's not observed, which means that um, we don't really know what's going on. We don't know who's offline, we don't know who's disconnected, and we only hear the voices of people who are connected. So this creates this huge bias, this cycle where you hear, hear from the people who might be favored members of society, who may be the privileged. And we've already ha heard some of these problems uh, this morning. But uh, what we do is we, um, we're a real-time internet observatory, which means we, we do kind of like uh, the weather monitoring we saw this morning, but for connectivity. So that means um, you can see if there's bad internet somewhere. You can see if it's shut down or switched off somewhere. And that informs you about the situation on the ground. Uh, sometimes this happens when there's crisis, natural uh, events like weather, storms, problems like this, but also political incidents, scandals, corruption, governments switch off the internet. And uh, just in the last few months, we've seen cases of mass killings covered up by internet shutdowns, where the world really doesn't know how to, how to report these. So uh, this is really a new, um, new form of science. This is a new form of monitoring which aims to tell us about people on the ground and how they're affected, and it's really community-driven to deliver that. Well, give us some scenarios on what kinds of internet shutdowns we've seen out there. You mentioned that it can be anything from political crises, but there's also economically-driven uh, ones that we've seen. Just give us a sense of that, and moral ones too, stuff like you know, cheating, covering cheating in exams. Just give us a range of the th kinds of shutdowns you've been able to, to get a sense of after seeing some sort of dip in uh, the connectivities in certain regions. Right, so um, Netbox has tracked uh, some 50 countries which have shut off the internet this year. And they happen for a variety of reasons, but some of them are really shocking. Uh, like we saw there, the school exams, to stop children cheating in school exams. And you look at the kind of impact this has on development, uh, it's really tragic, because this is money coming from the people's pockets. This is um, money that really isn't there in the first place. So one example, one name that was up there was Ethiopia, which shut the internet during school exams for four days this year. Um, estimated economic impact of five uh, million US dollars per day. And that is um, the this, this small upcoming tech sector in the country, but also informal economies. You have farmers, traders using the internet, using messaging, WhatsApp, 
to sell their goods, and they can't do this when they're cut off. So you have businesses being, you know, going bust, basically, and you also have um, real problems for freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Uh, you also have political scandals. You have governments that don't want uh, the current situation to be heard. There, there are situations like the mass killings that I've just mentioned, where that news, you know, they really try to stop human rights reporting. Um, but also, uh, there's national decency, which gets called up quite often, say, after a terror attack. Um, just when people need that assistance the most, you need to contact loved ones, friends, family. Uh, but the government wants to keep its image clean, and something gets switched off, whether it's at the local level or the national level. And you need transparency, you need real-time monitoring to be able to detect these incidents. Great. Doug, give us a bit more context about the grinder question and the Kazakhstan experience and what we should be taking out of those uh, two uh, instances there. Thank you, Nandira. I think if we look throughout history, governments have always tried to control information and communications technology. Just think back to the 16th century. What was the revolutionary technology in the 1500s? Gutenberg's printing press. And King Henry VIII in 1534 banned the import of any book into England that was printed on Gutenberg's press. Last century, Ceausescu in Romania bans the photocopier. The Soviets block radio broadcasts. So what you see from a human rights perspective is governmental attempts to control information and communications technology. Where do the questions come in? There are at least three new things we have to keep in mind. What's new? One, the role of the private sector in non-state actors in what we call expression suppression. It will look at things like hate speech, online harassment, particularly of female activists, mm. company algorithms that determine the findability, the visibility, of information that we see. So one, the private sector. Two, data. Data is everywhere. It's related to point one, but we're told that we can get the latest and greatest app. We can purchase it, but we don't purchase it with cash. We purchase it with our data. It reminds me of the legend of Faust, who sold his soul for earthly pleasures. We're told that there's a Faustian bargain 2.0. We too can get the earthly pleasures of coolness and convenience. If only, as we see in the example of Grinder, we surrender our innermost secrets. Three, economics. The economics of technology fundamentally shift the conversation around technology and human rights. The marginal cost of adopting technology, in certain cases, approaches zero. Think about a school textbook in certain circumstances. That's the upside. What's the downside? The marginal cost of surveillance also approaches zero. What we're finding around the world, I was in Prague just on November 17th. They were telling me in the bad old days, they needed secret policemen to keep an eye on dissidents. Now. Around the world, China has 220 million surveillance cameras. Not only that, there's a risk with humans. Sometimes they look the other way. Sometimes they're actually aligned with dissidents. Surveillance cameras and algorithms are an obedient army. So as a result, as we look at digital technology, there are tremendous upside benefits. But as the questions illustrate, we also have to consider risk. Thank you for that. And so, just as a quick follow-up, this civic space that we absolutely must protect, um, often in a world of digitization, we are all being told whether we are state, non-state, or private sector actors, we must sort of all worship at this altar of more innovation, and the solution out of everything is more innovation. But what is your sense about 
Um, if we assume we all, at the end of the day, exist in a civic society and are first and foremost members of a civil society, what, is, what should we be thinking about, whether in, at the end of the day our paycheck comes from the state or from private sector actors? What do you sense is the role of a civil society and all of us really being part of that in ensuring that we protect this civic space in the digital age? Thank you. You raised at the beginning the old adage, move quickly and break things. And I was thinking about that as I, during lunch, read an article about Germany, which is trying to figure out what to do with their high-level nuclear waste. The challenge they have is they need to store it for one million years. And they're nervous that centuries from now, they won't know how to communicate to future generations not to go there. It's not a sunken pyramid that they should drill into to find secrets, because if they do, they will die instantly. And I was thinking about our time frame. There is a cost to inaction. But in some sense, we're in the first day of the first year in the life of digital technology. So what I would say is, yes, we can move quickly, but let's also move smartly. And let's not break things. Let's focus on making things. And I think there's a role for all of us in trying to work together whether or not you consider yourself to be part of the digital rights community, let's work together to put that framework in place, which I think will be what's essential for a truly rights-respecting digital society in the future. And so to both of you, and you, either one of you can go first, let's also just talk about the resilience that we're seeing from the communities facing some of these um, serious harms. What are just some examples of how you've seen people trying to cope with this despite the sort of onslaughts and violations to their rights? And different ways people are just trying to, to, to fight back against this kind of uh, creeping violations. Well, we've found that the solutions come from the grassroots up. Uh, it turns out all the ideas, um, all the ideas that the West tried to deliver initially when it came to connectivity and internet freedom weren't really the solutions that people were looking for. Uh, it turns out that policy has a much larger part to play, that you can actually um, talk with governments on some level, and that you can make facts-based arguments. So this has been one shift. The other is the realization that there's no real thing as digital rights. Um, it turns out that digital rights really are human rights in this day and age. Uh, everything runs through connectivity, through the internet. You can't have other things if you don't have a trustworthy internet and free and open internet. So whether you're talking about elections, one example, uh, we had the Election Pathfinder uh, project last year, which sought to find out what connectivity does to elections. And we looked at uh, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, and we found uh, huge cases of interference in, in democratic processes that were really happening on the digital level. And I'm, I'm not talking about, uh, say, Facebook and that kind of interference or manipulation. Uh, this is more basic. This is um, cases of communities uh, just physically disconnected for periods when they should be voting, when, when their votes should be counted. And there's a lot of tinkering going on on the digital level that is uh, really only now being mapped. So this is what it's about. It's about listening. It's about listening to what communities want and really partnering to deliver that, um, which is the new, the new phase of, of um, rights, uh, both online and offline. Great. Doug, any examples for us? Four things. One, laws that permit free expression consistent with international law. Many governments are weaponizing legitimate concerns around disinformation and fake news. Example, Egypt sentenced a female activist to two years in prison because she posted online a video saying the Egyptian government was not doing enough to address sexual harassment in that country. She was accused of spreading false news. We need to address the legal framework so that it's not overbroad, too. We need to look at online harassment. We need to come up with ways that we can actually protect activists against dis disinformation, bots, and trolls consistent with international law. I can share examples later. Three, we have to look at the ways that messages are amplified through algorithms on certain websites, particularly paid political advertisements. We hear this false statement that Facebook and others can't actually regulate political speech, paid advertising, 
because it's free speech. Paid speech is not free speech. Four, we need civic oversight over surveillance and surveillance technology. There's some very interesting initiatives to get the public involved in determining what technology should be purchased, how it's deployed, and accountability for its use. And since we have, happen to have a few more minutes, I mean, resili resilience in this world where these violations are happening seems to only gain center stage when it happens in certain parts of the world. And we were having this discussion around, for instance, the whole scandal with Cambridge Analytica. We tend to know it, for example, to have been this thing when it happened in the US and the UK, when in truth there were other parts of the world where these have been test beds. Or instances where we've seen countries, um, local activists going to use the legal systems, however imperfect they are, and, and getting some small wins. And I'd love you to give that example we've seen, in, uh, for example, in Zimbabwe, about how something technical uh, got a major win through a system that would have otherwise not allowed them to get that, just to showcase what resilience looks like and how we should be looking for new stories on how to navigate this. Earlier this year, the internet was shut down in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights and MISA brought a court case, and we all love our international human rights arguments, but what won the day there was actually a technical argument under the law, where under the law there was only a certain person who had the authority to shut down the internet. They went into court and said the wrong person closed down the internet. <laughs> Why was that helpful? Because it allowed the high court to rule in their favor in a way that was politically safe for them. They won, the internet was restored, and now there's actually a case on the rest of the merits that's proceeding as we speak. Wonderful. And Alp, you had also a story about how we're also placing pressure on the actors being told to switch off the, the kill switch and how we've gotten sort of corporate accountability around how um, the, these shutdowns are happening. Right. Please share that also. So it turns out a lot of the countries that are switching off the internet are actually quite proud about their digital development. They want to be uh, regional leaders in exporting ICT. And there's a real uh, dichotomy here between their actions and the way they want to present it. So it turns out that when you have monitoring, um, you can actually bring around that transparency. And you said this morning, not everything that matters is measured. And the goal has really been to make sure that everything that matters will be measured and will be called out. Because once you start calling it out, it stops being a viable uh, policy for governments to do this. Uh, the whole point of internet shutdowns is you silence a nation and the world doesn't even notice. Mm. If you can break this cycle, if you can make noise, um, whether it's the diaspora, whether it's, it's the news wires, if you can let people know in time, then it stops being a useful policy. It's one of the biggest emerging social problems around the world right now when you look at shutdowns. Uh, but the solutions are there and they're practical. So. No country wants to be, uh, it can't be a digital leader if it doesn't have digital, if, if people are, you know, if, if they don't have telecommunications. So transparency has to be uh, the leading solution for this kind of problem. Great. And one example that I actually always go back to is um, with an internet shutdown in uh, Cameroon and in the French-speaking parts of Cameroon. And what local entrepreneurs were doing is they started this e-refugee program where um, they would house anybody who was shut off of the internet. Other entrepreneurs would invite them to their homes, would invite them to their offices, uh, basically cross the river and get to the side of the, uh, you know, the, their own country where the internet was plugged in. And people were housing each other to give themselves those lives lifelines to, uh, to remain uh, connected. And pressure that has been placed where it's actually socially unviable if you're an actor who has, been, uh, has agreed to, to switch off the internet, you'll not be allowed into this room. So solidarity is, is, a, is a really important sort of like uh, bridge to helping people understand this. And I think for this audience, maybe many of you have not experienced this. Maybe this is not imaginable in your context, but this is what's also the flip side that we are seeing um, to these kinds of connections where we're not thinking about these things from a political, civic, economic, and social lens all at once. It's calling for new ways of thinking. And to us, um, when we did this work with the UN Secretary General's report, we did say we emphasize that human rights apply offline, 
uh, online as they do offline. The question is not if, it is really about how. And how we, we're going to do that is really about also going back to our humanity, not waiting for these things to happen in a certain corner of the world for them to get a world stage using the tools that we already have today to get to know about the rest of the world and how these things are happening so we can also stand in for those who are uh, going to need our voices so that when it comes for us as well, there will be others who will say they came for us, therefore we have come for them. So we're going to leave you with that, not to depress you again. I think I've not brought the best of stories today, but it's just to show you the complications we all have to um, get a sense for. And i just hand back to you guys, any parting shots, anything you want people to take away from this conversation? One more thing, anyway. <laughs> yeah, just because we're here marking the Nobel Peace Prize, I thought I would just take that moment to say that I went into the Peace Prize Museum, and I was stunned by one thing. The number of laureates who have spent time in jail. Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Lech Valenza, Andrei Sakharov, Shireen Abadi, Liu Jaibo. The list goes on and on. And what we see around the world is that countries are converting the rule of law into the rule by law to suppress peace and social justice. That has happened traditionally on land and I fear that it will increasingly occur online. So while we focus on digitalization and there are great tools for development, Norway has a particularly important role in ensuring that in the digital era, human rights are respected for all. Alf? Absolutely. So That leadership is really important. And I think I just want to have a look at um, how uh, we might use big data and data science for good. Because um, quite often, these get a bad reputation. You look at the way people's personal data are collected or correlated. And I, I just remember earlier this year, uh, some 20,000 Sudanese uh, protesters and activists uh, were uh, collecting data, sharing data, about their internet, because they knew they needed internet before they could create change in their country. And they had transition, and, and they managed to improve their situation after a lot of human loss, a lot of human tragedy. So um, it just shows that data science can go hand in hand with fundamental human rights, and that progress is on the horizon. We're coming to the era of um, national internets or intranets, Right now, we've just seen this happen in Iran. We're also coming to the era of a hyper-targeted uh, censorship and um, manipulation of connectivity by demographic, by who you are, by your social class and status. This is 2020. That's what we're going to see in the next 12 months. So we need to really pull our stuff together and work together to solve these problems. So the impetus is on all of us to make sure that we keep top of mind that democracy and human rights still remain elusive offline, and we cannot have there's a moral obligation to make sure that we do not have the technologies we are deploying out there with the best of intentions, exacerbating those violations. So keep yourself informed. There are stories of resilience as just as much as the stories of various harms. There are people who are looking to be amplified, not necessarily for people to speak for them. And um, I think all, it's all, we are all interconnected in this day and age. What happens in Sudan, what happens in Ethiopia, one day will have an impact on what happens in Norway. Let us not wait until that moment, and let's make sure we're able to stand in for those who are not be able to be seen today in these violations. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.